think that I am. Da, da, da. I am. Am I sharing the? Okay. Yep, yeah, you're sharing the presentation. Hi everyone, and welcome to this week's Jakarta Tech Talk. Today we have Fabio Teresa, who's going to be sharing his presentation. So, Fabio, I'm going to let you go ahead and jump into it. Okay, just give me a second because I think that I'm sharing the manager, but not the presentation itself. Uh, oh, gotcha. Where do I change that? Okay, so I have to stop it. Now I have to. Capture screen. Okay. Perfect. Next. Can you see it? Mm. Nope. Uh, okay. Give me another second. Do, do, do. Center view should be not not this one. This one, okay. Now it should be okay. Yes, that's great. Excellent. Apologies for the technical issues. Okay, so many thanks for having me by. It is a pleasure uh, to talk in this Jakarta e Tech Talk. So this is ten strategies for developing reliable Jakarta e and micro profile applications for the cloud application development for modern times. And um, before we begin, it would be good if everyone uh, that is uh, seeing this talk recorded on live to have intermediate knowledge of what Jakarta Java e is in a sense, uh, what the Eclipse Micro Profile uh, project works, and some notions on distributed concepts and clustering. So if that is a problem, don't worry. If you have any questions at any time, let Vanessa know, and she and I will find the uh, time to reply to them. So speaking today, it's Fabio Teresa. Uh, a pleasure to meet all of you. I am service team leader at Payara Services Limited, which is a company that works for in, that is based on the UK. And we are the main maintainers of the Payara platform, which is uh, an, in a sense, a replacement or evolution of the original Glassfish uh, open source edition server. We also offer commercial support and open JDK support via a partnership that we have for Azul Systems, via Azul Systems. Uh, we are founding members of the Eclipse Micro Profile project. We are board members of the Enterprise Edition for Java project as well. And we are major contributors to the Jakarta EA specifications. So we are very well involved in all of this process. So, um, as you probably are be aware, not to dwell too much on it, Jakarta E, which is the current, let's say, iteration of Java E, which was originally the enterprise solutions for Java application development, uh, originally conceived by Oracle. Uh, as of two years ago, it was donated to the Eclipse Foundation, and it's now a fully open source technology, which is governed by a bot project called the Enterprise Edition for Java. And the idea, the idea of this is just to allow everything that it's uh, a standard specifications for Java be open source so that anyone, not only big vendors, but uh, any contributors, uh, individual or small organizations are allowed to uh, implement or even use their own versions of the technology. So at the moment, there are no reference implementations, but the current edition of the Eclipse Classics project, which was released a few weeks ago, which is Classics 6, which at the moment, I think it's in Nightly Build mode. Um, it's the current, let's say, it's standard of how Jakarta E9, which is the next version of the, of the technology, should behave. So Eclipse MicroProfile, on the other hand, was initially conceived as a technology to uh, develop uh, cloud-oriented microservice uh, applications due to how slow Java E was at the moment in innovating the platform for this, kind of, this type of architectures. So it was similar to Java E, but with less restrictions. The idea is that you, anyone could put the code ahead of the specifications, see that there was an issue, a uh, use for that technology, write a few the set of tests as part of the TCK and 
publish it, and that would be an API that could be designed a part of this uh, 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 of this technology. So at some point, the idea was that uh, MicroProfile was going to be like the standard of innovation in the uh, enterprise Java environment. But there come there it Jakarta it come out of the gate uh, at a full surprise. So there was some kind of overlap on thinking, okay, what of the what about of these APIs on MicroProfile that can be used in Jakarta and vice versa? So at the moment, they say. Uh, Let's say uh, uh, we are on a roadblock. We're trying to figure out uh, if the full uh, technology of MicroProfile can be brought over to Jakarta or if it should be remaining as its own uh, framework apart with uh, clear goals and mindset. So I'll uh, be using this technology to illustrate some of the strategies, but they may change in the future if they become officially part of Jakarta e or if they be stay at their own um, technology in a sense. So let's talk about the main challenges that we have for Java app application development nowadays. One of the problems that we mostly have, or at least most of the users that I have interacted with has, is proper distribution application development. That means an application that lives in a distributed arrangement uh, that is either horizontally or vertically scale up, and it should handle some degree of quality attributes. That means that it needs to respond to an appropriate number of current re user requests per second and to allow these users to feel that the application is reliable and it is performing well. So one of the main mechanisms through history that has allowed us to do this is clusters, which uh, if some of you are aware of how clusters work or if you were aware of how clusters work on application server technology, where uh, clusters was this is let's say a static method of defining a set of multiple server instances that live on a network and then you will have to manually configure the mechanisms on which these clusters start and handle load balancing handle the request for all these users handle the security aspects of it the uh, idea is to optimize these resources when you expect a high load this uh clusters will handle it. And when it not, the idea is that we would reduce the resource consumption in order to allow this, uh, the, the op an optimization of the cost uh, used to um, maintain this cluster. High availability and reliability, as I said, because the idea is to allow users to feel like the application is performing well without any impact on their, let's say, daily usage. And to also divide the workloads and simplify coding. Because if at the end, developers were developing complex applications with too much boilerplate, then it would, in the long term, become a nightmare to maintain. So the question is, can Jakarta a microprofile or microprofile help with reliable clustering? And the answer is yes, of course it can, but there are some set of strategies that you need because from the get-go, this is not clear. There is, uh, the main challenge is that there are no standard APIs in Jakarta at the moment that define how a vendor that implements the specifications define how clustering should work in many aspects. So. And this is, only not, this is not the only problem because microservice architectures have their own specific demands and requirements on how you should implement these distribution arrangements. So unfortunately, even there is no standard mechanism, no, not a starting point that you can use, there are some strategies that has been proved through the, let's say through the last latest years of these technologies as come and go, and we have developed applications for them that you can use. Uh, the future is looking bright because the idea is that after Jakarta A10 comes out of the gate, uh, future versions of the of these specifications will bring changes, and hopefully there will be a standard specification that allows you to define how distributed arrangements should work. So at the moment, the only thing that we have that is in a sense standard in Jakarta A for distribution is this distributable element. In, that you can define in the web XML deployment descriptor. Those of you who are familiar with the server specification are aware that you can define this as a way to tell the servlet container that web sessions that live in that container should rep be replicated to other members in a cluster arrangement. However, all of that definition is in a sense is just a mildly stipulated contract that the vendors can follow up to some point. 
But for example, uh, Wildfly does it differently to what Payara Server does or to what Open Liberty does or to what WebLogic does. So each vendor can do it differently. And this is actually just only limited to web sessions. What about data that is persistent on a database or data that is managed as part of uh, the AGV container? All of that is not correctly standardized. So it is a bit limiting. So in order to fill the gaps, each vendor must apply cluster mechanisms, design and promote distribution features, because the idea is that we need to allow users to be productive, productive with the definition of these clusters and maintaining them in the long term. What happens when, for example, an application that is developed for a small user base needs to scale up and it now needs to be moved to the cloud? And as a developer, you think to know, OK, my application was handling 10 users per second, which was <laughs> absolutely a small number. And now it needs to handle hundreds or even thousands of users per second. How can I adapt my application to do that with minimal code changes? So it falls on us vendors to fill the gaps in that Jakarta EA specification doesn't give us the strategy to do that in order to promote them uh, to allow that. However, there are no silver bullets. Even if we have no standards, these strategies, are, these strategies are not silver bullets that should be applied in all cases because there are, of course, some mild considerations when you are developing a new application and you should be aware that if you're doing that, then uh, you could fall in some problems if you are not uh, considering uh, some, let's say, specific uh, problems that you might arrive, that you might encounter while developing these applications. So let's start with strategy number one, which is statelessness. So one question that I get asked about when uh, a new develop a new uh, developer is starting a new project is, should I handle the state of my application in memory? And the common answer that I give then is don't bother doing that because it's uh, complicated to maintain in the long term. It is better if you just focus on stateless components. That means there is no state in memory. Every, the state of the application is either handled it in one of the extremes of the entire topology of the, of the infrastructure. Either it is handled on the client per client session or it is handled on the other end, which is the data stores, either a relational database or a NoSQL database on some S3 bucket or, or high-end store that you can use on your cloud provider. The idea is that you should use less memory in the middleware, hence you optimize resources. You are, your application is easy to coordinate because you don't need to worry about migrating or maintaining data in memory, and you use less code to also do that, so you also have that as a bonus. And how to do this? If you're using the CDI specification, you should focus on using the request scope annotation. Or if you're using the common ground AGV app specification, you should be using the stateless annotation, which is pretty, pretty straightforward. So here's an example. You have a component called calculator resource, which is a JAXRS resource in or in northern terms, it's just a simple REST service that has this method that allows users to execute a calculation. And in order to do that, the only thing that I'm doing is relying on two uh, resources that are given me by the container. One is an instance of a calculator service, and this instance is managed by CDI dynamically. That means that when I'm using calculator service.get, every time that I execute this method, I'm getting an instance that is dynamically resolved by the CDI container. When I execute the method, I'm also retrieving the name of the current principal, which in other terms is the user requesting to do this operation. So I'm forcing authentication and I'm forcing authorization of this user, every request that is being executed by this service. So a state lesson is, is that, that you need for every request that you are getting for each user, you are assembling all the components that you need in order to execute the operation. When all this, the, the operation is done, all of these components that are needed are garbage collected by the JVM or returned to a pool or the state is discarded. So how about singletons? So strategy number two is that you should consider the use of singletons because even if singletons are just simply the management of just one instance per JVM of this specific class or component that you're handling, they can be useful to, uh, uh, let's say, handle the coordination of certain resources, but you, you must be aware not to do over coordination because if you are writing resources to 
or you are writing code to prevent resources from being locked out or from being accessed concurrently by millions of users at a time, then you are getting yourself into trouble. So my recommendation is make a single tune only when A, you don't need to do or worry about concurrent modifications. That means if, for example, you have a single tune that is controlling a key that needs to be accessed by only one user at a time, then that is not a good idea because then you need to work about uh, co coordinating that concurrent ac access. So that is really just a headache in plain play. So uh, don't worry about that. Or the single a single aspect of an application requires continuation. So if, for example, you need to access a cache and this cache has sensitive information that is stored for each user, then just uh, forget about writing your own cache. You can just simply write a single tune that works as a facade or just a wrapper for this cache and allows you access it when the time is right for these specific users. So like the first strategy you can use on the CDI spec, the application scope annotation, which will allow you to mark a component as a single tone, or for the AGV specification, you can use the uh, at singleton annotation. So here is an example of code. I have a component here called token generator which is a class that I can be used for an application that needs to generate JSON web tokens, more on that later, that you can use in order to allow users to authenticate against your application. So the tokens need to read a specific data. Which data they need to read? They need to read the specific data about the issuer or the entity that is issuing the tokens. So you don't want this a specific entity, it's read only. It doesn't change per the life cycle of an application. So you might want to read it once. And once you have that, you just can simply allow the uh, component to generate a token every time it receives a request. So the reason why I'm turning this into a singleton is because of that. It needs to read this data once, and once it has it, it just only needs to concern itself on executing the operations. So it is a perfect example for a, for a singleton component. However, and this is strategy number three, what about true singletons? The problem with singleton is that the pattern allows you to define an instance of a class per JVM. That means that if on a distributed arrangement, you will have multiple JVMs, as many nodes as you have. If you have a cluster with five nodes, then you have five separate JVMs. And if you define a component as a singleton, then you will have a singleton in one of each of these JVMs. And that is usually not a problem. However, remember what we talked about on our, on, on our previous slides. We'll talk about coordination. And the issue with coordination is what happens if you need to read data that it's constantly updated? For example, in the previous example that we have this issue object uh, or property, which is read from uh, configuration property, it is uh, only at, it is only read at the beginning. Now you don't need to concern yourself about it. But what happens when you update this value in real time and you need to refresh all of your properties? Then you can just simply do that, refresh the singleton. But if the singleton is stored in a mo across multiple JVMs, you could have an inconsistency issue. So sadly, at the moment, there is no Jakarta E standard for a true singleton yet. This is something that we might improve in the future by enhancing the CDI specification. However, this is what vendors come to the rescue and PR, which is the PR platform, which is the product that we maintain, has a annotation named add cluster that allows uh, instances of a singleton class to be defined and coordinated cluster-wide. So this is transparent to the developer. The idea is that you only define this add cluster at annotation on a singleton component and the container does the rest. Uh, this is automatically just coordinated across the cluster. And if, for example, a node that processes or handles that current instance of the EVM is lost or if it's, uh, or if it crashes or it needs to be regenerated, then that, that data is migrated to another uh, live node in the cluster. So other vendors have similar solutions. And even if that is not an issue, or for example, you don't want to rely on those solutions, you can implement a caching solution that can also help. However, this might be a bad idea if you are not fully aware of how caching can also have its own challenges. So I just uh, say to use whatever the vendor is giving you. So here's an example of how can I define 
a true singleton. I have a component service named session rating service. And the idea is that I am annotating it with add cluster and defining it uh, with this configuration, uh, setting the call post construct unattached property to false. That states only call the post construct method when this instance is uh, created. When the instance is migrated from one component, from one node to the, of the cluster to another node, then you don't need to call it again. Hence, this is preventing reinitialization of the component. And if there is a long operation here in the initialization process in this method, then you are preventing that execution when the instance needs to be regenerated in a sense, when it's migrated across nodes. So we were talking about caching, right? So strategy number four relates to that. We told a statelessness is good, but even if we say that there is always a need to handle state in memory, at some point, for example, you might want to prevent data reprocessing. For example, let's say that you execute your application is connected to a relational database and you execute a, a SQL query that takes 10 minutes to, uh, for example, um, construct a, let's say, report of, that, of user data that requires just one parameter. For example, the user uh, login uh, or the email address or some identifier. What happens if the user runs that exact same query again? So you might want to prevent the user from waiting 10 minutes again. And in order to do that, you can, provi you can provide a cache so that your application stores that data in memory for that specific users and you can just present it again, preventing you to reprocess all that data. Again, you can also optimize resource man uh, the resource management of this information because if, for example, you now have this data in memory and let's say, for example, you have this information that can be reused for another user, then you don't need to maintain this structure for these two separate users, or even if there's not only two users, but millions of users that can reuse that same information, you can maintain it in only one place and allowing these users to access it at some point. So for Jakarta A, sadly, there is no standard Jakarta e APIs. However, there are excellent third party solutions like a cache or a spring cache. However, at some point there was a uh, an API named Jcache, which sadly was proposed to the JCP. It was an, a specific specification, sensor redundancy, that was to be considered to be included in, ja in Java E8. Unfortunately, it didn't make the cut. It was fully defined. And for example, we at the PR platform has implemented our own, we have used our own implementation of, uh, of the Jcash API, but it hasn't been made part of it. Uh, hopefully, now that Jakarta is out of the open, we have a chance of fully submitting a new specification of uh, Jcash as part of Jakarta eAPI. So uh, there is a, a, one of the solutions that I can recommend to use. If you're not happy with these solutions, you could develop your own cache using map-based solutions. I have seen this happen in some companies and some users thinking that they might not need to overthink a map-based solution for a simple cache. However, there are really good challenges that you need to think about specifically when coordinating and invalidating data. So I just simply say, don't bother implementing your own solution, just consider a third party solution and you should be go because these solutions are already talking on these issues. So here is an example of what I was talking about. You talking about the same session rating service. Let's say for example, that a user wants to compute the rating for a specific session. And the only thing that it needs to provide the API is the ID of that session. So you could compute the rating since the session is just read only data because the session happened only once that you can retrieve the information from the database, put it on a cache and then return it. This is an in-house solution because I'm using a simple map and the method put if accent will just simply call this specific uh, method if the uh, value is absent from the database. In particular, well, this is actually not performant because the put if accent method will always execute retrieve session from database. So this is one of the things I was talking about when you're using map solutions. And these challenges that I was talking about is not only related to uh, preventing non-performant code, but also coordinating data management in a cluster environment. For example, if one of your nodes contains data and that node is 
crashing, or for example, or needs to be regenerated, what do you do with that data? Do you invalidate all at once and allow it to be recalculated at another node, or do you migrate it in some capacity, or do you distribute all of that data equally to all the other nodes? So these challenges that I'm talking about should be considered when developing these solutions. You also need to think about invalidating data on demand. What happens when the data on this on, on a specific cache is deemed stale and you need to recalculate it because it was updated in the data store or database or whatever. So this is important as well. And lastly, as I was talking about, you need to think about failover and data migration. So for the PR platform, you use Jcache support, which is the API I mentioned, and the coordinates are the Javax cache, cache API. As you can see, it still uses the old Javax prefix uh, package name, which is unfortunately <laughs> a sign that it is an old API that's still part, or it was going to be part of Java E. So hopefully in the future, we can replace this Javax with Jakarta. Uh, there are also proprietary APIs as well that we use in the Pera platform that internally. And the caching engine that is implementation of this API, it's a product that we use internally called Hazelcast Community Edition, which is a powerful distributed in-memory data grid, which is uh, similar to other products uh, from other vendors like Infinispan from Red Hat or Coherence from Oracle, which was recently open source as well. So here is the same code. But now we are using the cache annotation, sorry, the cache interface, which again, it's uh, as this is a resource man maintained by the container, we need to inject it. We get a cache and J J cache cache works like maps in a sense. They are not technically maps, but the structure and the methods that they offer and part of as part of their public APIs work in a similar manner. So here I would just call the same method, put with accent, uh, retrieve the information from the database and just simply put it there on the map. If it's not absent, then there's no problem. I just can get the method. Again, this method is not performant because every time I will be computing this from the database. But if, for example, I try to retrieve this information in another node of the cluster, then it will be available right away. A better solution is to use annotations. In this case, I'm using the same method that I and given to you, which is retrieve session from DB. But in this case, I'm using the cache result annotation, which instructs the container to cache the result of this ex of, of the execution of this method the first time that it's called. And then every time that you call get rating, sorry, you would prevent the execution of this method internally. How do you annotate or how do you link the references of the resource for the uh, specific um, key on the cache. So we use the cache key annotation to mark the ID of the session that we are trying to calculate. It's right in front on the database as the, um, as I said it earlier, the, ca the key in the corresponding cache. And additionally, we want to give this cache a name. So we are using the cache defaults annotation, which gives the cache managed by all of these methods in the session rating service component with the ratings name. Next strategy would be a CDI over AGV. So this is something that I always like to tell uh, application developers, which are starting with Jakarta. Uh, the usual question is what component model should I consider? So at the moment we have the old, older component model with each, uh, which is AGV, Enterprise Java Beans, which is uh, technically not really that old, but it started, let's say on, on really as a really rough project that uh, it wasn't intuitive to use. It was a bit of a design. It had a lot of complications because the developer had to write a lot of interfaces and bind those interfaces to internal components that at the end was too unproductive. But at some point, the specification modernized itself and now it has a, a, a reached a stage where you can use it without that much, let's say, <laughs> boilerplate code. Uh, AGV has been uh, a resilient reviews, but uh, at the end of the day, obsolete in the specification because it hasn't been updated that much in this last, uh, the, in these latest years, it hasn't been considering a lot of the challenges that all the model components like the Spring framework has, for example. So as a contract to that, CDI was created, which is more modern, flexible, and uh, 
the most important quality, it is extensive. By yourself, you can write CDI extensions that allow you to do things that you couldn't do with the vanilla framework, which is something that AGB doesn't allow you to. And this is the main reason why I choose to use CDI. Because CDI, it's more lean, it's more powerful, and it gives you the capabilities to write your own extensions and to fill the own needs of your product or your applications if those aren't provided by the, by the framework. Not only that, but Jakarta and MicroProfile both re rely on CDI. The CDI specification is the cornerstone of MicroProfile. So if you're thinking about developing applications that use both frameworks, AGV won't help you because AGV is not part of MicroProfile. So if you write an AGV component, it won't be able to interact with MicroProfile APIs. So here is a quick comparison. You can see that the components are exactly the same, the session service, it's just, an, in this case, it's a singleton on AGB or it's an application scope on CDI. The annotations are just simply replaced. And in order to access all the components on the same spectrum, the AGB specification relies on the AGB annotation, which allows you to look up dynamically on, at, let's say, uh, at creation time, all the components which uh, match the exact interface or class name that is here and inject them. And with the CDI specification, we have the add inject, which does the same. The thing is that CDI is more powerful because you can inject resources and other components that are part of the CDI specification and other components like even ATB uh, beans or other resources provided by the container. Whereas AGB is not as powerful as that. There are some caveats. For example, if you are familiar with the AGB, there is a feature of the of the framework, I'm sorry, of the API called timers, which allow you to define reusable scheduled tasks that you can define. So when these tasks are, let's say, uh, as, or, or the timers that are defined for these tasks are expired, then they will run right away and they will be executed as a business method. Uh, there is no CDI equivalent yet, but you can write your own code using the Jakarta concurrency API that allows you to run a managed, managed scheduled executor, which is a service that allows you to execute tasks in the future. Uh, another caveat is that there are no pooling mechanisms present in CDI. AGV allows you to pull beans in a way optimizing resources, but Again, uh, that is actually a, a byproduct of the time where AGV, where the AGV specification was designed. So it wasn't, it isn't something that is, let's say, that more relevant for modern applications than now. And additionally, there is no standard asynchronous execution in CDI. However, there is a feature on MicroProfile that can help you with this. So if you are using any of these features, in this case, you might want to stay on AGV. However, I in let's say, uh, well, not back, but I <laughs> implore you to consider when you are developing new projects where no, you really need these features. And if you don't need them, then you can just simply close over AGV and use CDI instead. So yeah, uh, let's ignore this one. The next strategy will be JPI caching. So we were talking about data that is stored in a relational database. So that data needs to be cached as well, because as we talk about, the issue with caching data is that you want to prevent re-execution to the database when in some instances can be an expensive process, not only for the user, but for you, because if you are executing these processes in the database, then that might cost you some money if that is repeatedly done every day. So within the Jakarta specification, there is a a sub-specification called the Java Persistent API, which is key to this. And this API has defined, let's say, an standard caching mechanisms that implementers can use. However, there are two levels of cache that you can use in JPI, level one and level two. Level one is standardized between the API and every vendor must implement it and must provide the same mechanisms. So you don't need to worry about that, but there are no standard mechanisms for le second level cache. So level two cache offer fast data retrieval. Level one is not that as fast, level two is. And each vendor does it differently. And not all vendors are 
manda mandated to implement it. So the PR platform relies on Eclipse Link, which is a open source product also maintained by the Eclipse Foundation, which is the default implementation of JPA or WASP, because at the moment Jakarta doesn't have uh, default implementations or reference implementations. And through this feature called the Hazelcast Cache Coordination, uh, we internally on, P on the PR platform allow cache on level level two cache to be coordinated across nodes. How to do this? Simple, there is this file called the persistent XML deployment description on the uh, JPI specification that allows you to define how you connect to your database. What you do is to configure a persistence unit, give it a name, define the transaction type that is used for this persistence unit and tie that persistence unit to an standard J uh, data source. This is vanilla JPA, and this is how it's always been done on the Jakarta e world. So to define a caching, you have to use the shared cache mode property. There are multiple modes that you can configure. And the first one is enable selective. That allows to tell you that some entities that you manage in your application will be cached, but not all of them. How do you define which entities are cached? you use the cacheable annotation, which is uh, on a staple of the JPI specification. By telling an, an entity that is cache, it will use whichever attributes are marked as IDs of the entity as part of the keys that will be used automatically to cache the results. So for example, when you execute this JPQL query, which is, um, let's say, a placeholder language that you can use in order to um, retrieve entities from the database as replacement for the standard SQL language that you have. Then every time this query is executed, the results are cached internally and out by the container by using the IDs and the results of the entities. And whenever you need to retrieve them again uh, from the database, then the container will match the corresponding IDs and see if they are already cached internally. And it will prevent you from going again to the database and executing these methods. However, there is the problem because JPI cache is managed per node. You need to consider what happens if you are living in a cluster. So to do this, and this is the proprietary mechanism I was talking about for Piara, you have to configure the Eclipse cache coordination protocol uh, value, which allows you to define and a specific implementation on our coordination protocol class, which in the case of Piara is fish.priara persistent eclipse link cache coordination, okay, still cache publishing transportation manager, which is a long name actually, but it is just simple configuration setting that you have to specify with a channel, which is a particular name that you can give because you can use multiple channels per applications. This tells the container that if, for example, I have retrieved the session writing entities from the database in one node and that node crashes and there needs to be failover in some capacity to another node, then it will use this class internally to communicate under the covers and translate that data to the separate node, hence preventing you from losing that data and maintaining the cache in a distributed manner. Okay, so give me a pause for drinking water. Okay, strategy number seven is configuration. And this one is this is one of the preferred strategies that I would like to talk about because one of the common questions that you will ask yourself when starting a new project is where is my application configuration located? You need to re store that in an intuitive manner and retrieve it in very easily every time that you need to access those values. So sadly, there was going to be a job Java EA specification for Java E8, which was going to be Java configuration, which was going to be a standard technology, but unfortunately it was a scrap and it wasn't made part of the API. Around that time, MicroProfile was starting and one of the first APIs that was born in the project was MicroProfile configuration, which sat, which hopefully gave us a starting point to allow standardized configuration mechanisms. It's a highly sensible with sensible defaults it should work in most environments, especially cloud environments. So the micro profile configuration allows you to configure your application, which relies on centralized data sources. That means if you deploy an application that lives in 10 nodes, all 10 nodes should be able to access these data sources, no matter where. 
they're also sensible defaults. So for example, if you want to deploy your application on a station environment where the configuration is not ready, but you might want to prevent your application from breaking down because it doesn't have access to these values, you can prevent some sensible defaults so the application can work in some capacity. And you also have some integration with CDI, so you can inject these values when you need them. Or if you do not prefer to do manual injection, or if you simply would like to dynamically look for them, at runtime you can set a programmatic manner as well. So here's a comparison of what it's telling. If you want to inject these values in a static manner, you can just use the config property annotation, which is part of the API. Look for the value of the property demo.conference.speaker.venues and inject it in this link of strings. So as you can see, what it will take, uh, the configuration API will look for this property. It will attain this property as a string value and it will split it. Uh, as the specification states, the value should be a comma separated list of values. You should split it and put it into this list of strings. And if you can find it, they can just simply set the value to Ocarina, which it will be only one value in this list. You can also do the same with the programmatic lookup. To do that, you can all use the config provider dot get config static method, which will give you access on your container to the configuration object. And you can just simply run dot get value and just look for the property again and uh, set it as, <clears throat> set what is the, value that will be the result of this conversion. So in this case, I'm not uh, splitting the values as a list of strings, I'm just simply setting it as a single value string. It is actually helpful because the microprofile configuration allows you to define some sensitive data sources. So for example, if you are running your application on a Docker command, you can run, uh, you can configure um, Microprofile configuration property as an environment variable like this, which I'm using demo.conferences as speaker venues again. And as you can see, it is um, a string, a, a list of a comma separated list of values as an environment variable. And it will be automatically converted as a microprofile property, which is extremely helpful on a Docker container, which usually is configured in using environment variables. Or if you're using a Kubernetes cluster, you can use a Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes list of secrets or configure your containers to extract environment variables from them and how to set them up so that you don't need to do anything else. So it is configured to use the cloud by default. So strategy number eight, it is fault tolerance. And this is important because this is some specific challenge that many people don't think about. What should you do when in your distributed arrangement, a cluster node fails? What happens specifically in your application code when the database is not reachable because it crashed or because there is some communication issue? Or if, for example, you are using a third party service, either a legacy SOAP service or a modern JAXA REST service that you can access to. Or what happens when your own system is at a critical state? So your answer can be that you reply to the customer on a web page or on an error code that the service is not available. Please try again in five minutes because that is not acceptable in 2020. You need to adapt your application code to these fails and you need to use it. You need to do some tolerance of these fails in hence fault tolerance. So the microprofile fault tolerance API allows you to do this. And how, how do you do it? Well, the microprofile fault tolerance API is a set of standard patterns that guide business logic flow. That means that you have to specify what happens in the event of a failover and how the application should behave from that failover. This is by separating the execution logic from the execution itself. So you have logic that specifies the code or what to do when everything is correct. But you have also execution logic that specifies what happened when something is wrong. The advantage of this API is that it has been designed on top of CDI. The CDI spec has a feature called interceptors, which are annotations that allow you to define aspects like aspect-based programming would allow you to do. And these aspects allow you to intercept the execution of a method. So all of these are just simple custom interceptor annotations that you can use in your uh, and your application code. 
So fault tolerance supports the following tolerance pattern, retry, fault back, which I will show in an example in the following slide, ball head, circuit breaker, timeout, and asynchronous. So I previously mentioned that if you were preferring to use CDI over AGV, and on the AGV specification, there is an asynchronous annotation that allows you to define asynchronous code execution. So in CDI, that is not a, a feature, but on fault tolerance is a standard tolerance pattern. So you can use it here. Here is an example. So for example, I have this register method that will receive an attendee and register it to a session. So for example, I want to, because this method relies on, a, let's say on stable service that might fail because the service is not available, I'm not, might want to retry that. So I can configure the register method to be automatically retried up to five times, each time separated by a delay of 30 seconds. So I can give some leeway to the service to, re to recover itself of, of to, of to, or to allow me or any system administrator to find out what is happening with that service by warning it that it's happening something or it's having problems. However, this is not an ideal solution because if at the end of these five retries, the service is still down, you will get an error and then you will have to tell Stone something to your users. So a better strategy is to use a fallback method. So a fallback method is just a backup strategy for your method in case you that it fails and you can execute it successfully. So the configuration in this case is that I'm also having a retry policy for my method of retry three times, uh, each execution separated by one minute. And if in the case, all three retries fail, then fall back to this cache rating method. So what the add rating method is doing, it's trying to uh, add an attendee. Uh, or well, it gets an attendee, it gets a rating that this attendee wants to give to a session and just put it on the database. As you can see, I'm using the JPI, uh, a, a JPI methods, process and flush here, and this should go to the database. But if the database is not available and this method fails three times, I fall back to the cache rating method. So a cache rating method is simple. It uses a cache to get that rating and put it temporarily in memory. So as you see, the cache rating method is not actually going again to the database, but it's just simply storing the value in memory but it's giving something to the user. It's telling them, okay, your session was rate, even if it's not technically on the database at this moment. It will fall on you now, since you have multiple data stores, you have a cache with temporary values that need to be synchronized to the database, but you have prevented your user from being inconvenienced by these failures. So that is how you tolerate them. Strategy number nine, it's stale security. And it allows you, as I, as I said at first, my first strategy is handling stateless component. You need to concern yourself with securing them because at the end, if you're not securing your components in the right way, you're putting your business and your applications at risk. So when using stateless services, you should concern yourself with appropriately securing access to all resources, making sure that those endpoints are available only to the right people, which is authorization, and propagate secure information to other services. Because modern applications and microservices are using multiple data stores and data sources, you need to concern yourself what happens when a service that is being authenticated and secure from one specific user needs to call another service. Do I need to re-authenticate the user or can I use the secure information that I already verify for that user for the calling of this separate service. So these questions are important. So a good solution that you implement needs to make sure that each request that is validated or that is executed as part of this stateless components is validated separately in isolation. That means that every time that you send a request to these services, they have to validate the information every single time that when it comes from a client directly or an, or an end user. That means that user data should be idempotent. That means that every time that you're executing the same operation, you should get the same result without any alterations to the user identity and be portable. That means that if you move that data to a separate service and needs to be re-authenticated, it should yield the same result. 
And each node in a cluster needs to have all the right tools to validate this information. So there are multiple mechanisms and standards, but I think that the best solution is to use JSON Web Tokens. A JSON Web Token, it's a token-based authentication and authorization solution. It's based on a standard called OpenID Connect, and it's compatible with the standard. So if you are familiar with this uh, specification, which is an RFC specification, then you should be aware that it's a single JSON payload with a set of standard attributes or fields that should conform to a series of validation and specifications. So on the micro profile side, we have the JWT or JSON Web Tokens propagation API, which allows you to define how applications validate these tokens. So here is an example of a JSON Web Token. A JSON Web Token, as I said, is a config. Well, it's a set of payloads: a header, a proper payload which has all the attributes, or standard attributes that I mentioned, and a signature, which is encoded and is separated into three parts by uh, um, a dot. So, how do you do this? So, every time that you execute an HTTP request to an, an endpoint of your application, you need to send this token, and the token needs to be sent as part of the authorization bearer token header used on the HTTP request. And then you should receive this uh, method on your server, validate the token to make sure that whoever is sending this information is who says that it is, and verifying that the user has access to the methods that he is uh, trying to execute. So how do you do this on the, on the code base or, or on the server side? First, you need to define that your application is to be authenticated by MicroProfile JSON Web Token, and for that you use the login config uh, annotation. And you can also optionally declare what roles can be used to authenticate the users on your application. So this is authentication and this is authorization. Next, you need to define how these users or how these tokens will be authenticated. So the specification forces you to use these two properties. This is microprofile configuration as well. Allo allocation for a public key, which is the key that was used to sign this token that I was showing you, and an issuer or an entity that has generated this token. So if the token is has been used by this specific entity, then there is no problem, it is validated. And if the signature of that token validates against this public key, then the token is completely valid and you can allow the user to be authenticated. And how do I configure authorization? By using the roles allow annotation. This is an standard Jakarta annotation. So in this case, the JWT specification, it's integrated fully with Jakarta E. And it tells the container to allow users who have this role can vote to execute all of the methods in here. So the user is authenticated by validating the token and it is authorized by verifying and matching the roles that he has configured. So in the case of this method, which is rate, how do I know which user is executing them? So simply, I just inject the principle. And again, this is a Jakarta standard mechanism. And the principle is automatically obtained by using the SUP or the UPN uh, fields in the token. So the UPN and the SUP should give me an identity for the user, which in this case, it's uh, configured by using the email addresses of the corresponding user that is executing the method. So here we have another example again, but instead of using the principle, Let's say that I want to access more information about the token itself. So I can inject the token by using the JSON Web Token class, which is part of the MicroProfile JWT specification. And I can use this method get groups to see what are the groups or roles configuring the token. And I can pro programmatically validate this at runtime and see if the user is an admin or if the user is not an admin, I can just reject the execution by throwing a method which uh, a web application exception, which would return a false 03 for P then to the end user. Lastly, my final strategy for you, it's metrics. And this is a question that many users think about, but they do not try to optimize. So daily, you need to be thinking if you are an application maintainer, how good or bad is the state of your system? How can you optimize your environment based on real-time data? Is environment handling the load perfectly or is dragging or is lacking resources in order to 
give users a good response time, also you need to de analyze the data generated by application. So if, for example, you develop an application that manages users and you need to know how many user accounts are created per day in order to give those stats to upper management in your company or something like that, you might want to also try to see that. So MicroProfile Metrics allows you to do this. And MicroProfile Metrics is just a cloud-ready standard metrics format, which is based on the Prometheus format, uh, which is a standard of the Cloud Native Software Foundation. And it's just a, Prometheus is just an application, well, it's a metric server that allows you to aggregate metrics from multiple sources. The only thing that you need to do on your applications is to simply uh, nothing because it is automatically integrated with the, within the container. There's no bootstrapping code that it's needed. There are three base, uh, sorry, there are three scopes for the metrics that you can use base, which is metrics from the JVM and from the application server and container, like the amount of memory being used at the moment, the heap size that is being used, the number of or the current load of the CPU on the host machine that it's running the applications. Vendor, which is a standard set of metrics that each vendor can define if they want to, and they can provide to applications and developers and users. And lastly, application, which is it's based on metrics that you want to define for application data that you're managing, like the number of user accounts that you are creating on an application, for example. Each metric has its own set of metadata or tags that you can use in order for your Prometheus server configuration to graph those metrics in a specific manner, like this one. So you, here is a screenshot of the Prometheus server, which is uh, actually being used by a separate tool called Grafana, which is a, a graphic tool that can, can be, that can be bound or linked to an existing Prometheus server uh, configuration and show this data in real time. So there are current there are currently five types of metrics. I think I'm missing a sixth one: uh, gauge, counters, meters, histograms, and timers. And all of these uh, metrics follow a specific res um, specific goal. Counters, for example, counter uh, incrementally what are the current what is the value of a metric. Histograms map the current history of fluctuations of a specific numeric metric, and so on. So here's an example how I can configure application metrics. So for example, let's say that I want to see on my application that handles sessions, how many sessions were created since the application was deployed. So I can use the meter annotation, which will define a meter type metric named session.creation.tries. And this absolute allows me to specify the container that this is the absolute name of the metric. And every time this metric is called, this method is called, the metric will be recalculated in real time. So you will get this value automatically. And the only thing that I had to do is just to use an annotation. However, if you want to have more control on your metrics, you can use uh, specific programmatic mechanisms with the classes themselves. So here is a metric named session spaces, which is a counter. And this metric is uh, is being defined with the name session spaces. And I'm defining here that the name is not absolute. So the container will add a prefix to this metric as well. And how is this metric computed? Simple, I am using the class manually by calling the ink method by five every time that the method is called. So when the class is, in, when the class is, sorry, when this component is initialized, I will increment this counter to five, and then I can modify it as I want when the when the uh, class is following uh, is called successfully later. And for example, the Pera Platform API allows you to define metrics by using a specific XML configuration form named uh, Custom Metrics. And here I am configuring a metric called System CPU Load which allows me to define which is the current CPU value or load for the system that is handling the, um, sorry, that is being executed on the JVM or the host machine. And how I'm doing that, simple. I assign this value to an MBIN. This is standard JMX configuration for all of those who you are aware of with the JMX system. And I'm time the value of that metric dynamically to 
to that value. So I can reuse all the metric components or metric servers inside the JVM to fill in these values at real time. And I think that's it. So if there is any questions, feel free to let me know. Doesn't look like there's any questions right now, but thank you so much for your presentation. Okay, so just to finish up, uh, we up here Services Limited have a new project called, well, a new program called PR Reef, which is a community growth program. The idea is that we want to reach communities which are hosting their own events locally, uh, or in a, um, let's say in bigger environments. However, due to the current situation overall, I'm afraid that it will be only limited to online events. So if you are hosting an event in your local community and you would like to be uh, sponsored by us, let us know. Just contact us at uh, payera.fish slash riff and we'll gladly support you in anything that you want to do regarding the, uh, if you're using the Payera platform or if you're using Jakarta in some capacity. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, I hope that if you are still interested in Jakarta AE or you want to see more examples about all these strategies that I mentioned, you can just head to get started and you can get all the resources you need to start developing applications using Payera. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Have, have, have a good, good time. One. Bye. Bye.